Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles. Past, present, future, if we know about it. The Beatles individually, the Beatles as a group, you name it, we'll talk about it. I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk, as well as the host of his own Beatles video channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which has tons of Beatles-related interviews and uh, always good to spend some time there. Hey, Ken, how's it going? Hey, Alan. Hey, Darren. Hello, Ken. Be with Hi. you all again. And Darren DeVivo, who's been a DJ at WFUV 90.7 in the New York area for the past four decades. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else on WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, again. Good to see everyone. Okay. Not that I can see you, but you, you, you know what I'm talking about. Great to be here. This time, we actually are going to have a guest, and we're going to talk about something a little bit unusual. Um, it's going to be a, a, a rare opportunity for me to combine both my Beatles thing and my classical music thing, um, because we're going to be talking to Evans Mirages, the artistic director of the Cincinnati Opera, which is presenting a fully staged version of Paul McCartney's Liverpool Oratorio. So looking forward to that. Meantime, we have news from Ken. All right. Since our last show, here's what's been happening. Ringo Starr celebrated his 84th birthday yesterday and held his annual peace and love events in Los Angeles with wife Barbara and a guest list that included Joe Walsh, Fred Armisen, Ben Harper, Stephen Stills, Ed Begley Jr., He's there at every single one of these events. What is it about Ed, Ed, Ed Jr.? I don't get it. I guess they're good friends. Don was uh, at Roy Orbison Jr. Prior to this, before um, they all said peace and love, the big, uh, the big celebration at noontime, there were musicians that performed Ringo's music, including Ben Harper, Gabe Witcher, Willie Watson, Greg Lease, Don was Ben Dickey and Greg Bissonette with Steve Dudas. And uh, Ben Dickey performed Way to the World. Interesting. Um, there was a band there that performed two songs from Boo Coos and Blues. Fastest Growing Heartache in the West and the title track. That's some of the musicians that I just mentioned here. Uh, and also, Act Naturally, Ben Harper performed Walk With You. And at uh, Pacific Time, they all did the peace and love exclamation. Ringo every year asks his fans all over the world to say the words or think the words peace and love at 12 noon their time. A reminder that Ringo resumes touring with his all-star band on September the 7th in San Diego, ending September 25th at Radio City Music Hall for a total of 12 dates. And let's see if I have it here. Just got this today. Revival 69, released on DVD. This is the live piece in Toronto concert with John, Yoko, and the Plastic Unal Band. This is a brand new documentary. I haven't seen it yet, but this is going to be a busy week for me because I got this. And I got this. <laughs> What's that? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. So it's going to be... A Lennon full week for me. Uh, listening nonstop to mind games and watching this DVD. But it's got performances, this concert, from not only John and the Plastic Auto Band, but lots of 50s icons like Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard, Chuck Berry, uh, Bo Diddley, Gene Vincent, and also Alice Cooper is in here. And The Doors, although The Doors' performance wasn't filmed. So we'll see how it's covered here in this uh, documentary. Revival 69, just released on DVD. And I was also told that uh, last weekend, 
the documentary was shown in very select theaters. I believe they were all AMC theaters. And it's currently streaming on Apple TV. Oh, is it? Yep. Okay. That's what I've been told. Uh, there's a new video that was made for John's song, I Assume the Send, I'm Sorry, shot by John Lennon when he and Yoko first moved into the Dakota building. And this was shot on John's new Sony Portapak camera. Also, Paul, Paul McCartney, appears in a new HBO documentary on Steve Van Zandt. It's called Disciple. Paul appears with Bruce Springsteen, Bono, Eddie Vedder, Peter Gabriel, Joan Jett, and others to speak about Steve Van Zandt's life, music, and activism. Disciple is now streaming in the U.S. on Max. Also, Pete Best will be headlining a weekend festival in Delaware. This is for the annual Weekend at Bertha's Festival at Firebase Lloyd in Townsend on Friday, July 26th. Pete is scheduled to perform at 7 p.m. The festival runs through the 28th. The Weekend at Bertha's Festival got their name from the Grateful Dead's iconic colorful skeleton character named Bertha and song by the same name. This is a counterculture festival with psychedelic music, jam bands, and tie-dye clothes. You know, when you think psychedelic music, you automatically think of Pete Best. <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> well, that Gary was one Burr. of the reasons they, <laughs> they've since found out why he was thrown out of the Beatles, because he was bringing too much psychedelic uh, influence to the uh, Hamburg show. I'm sorry. We have the inside story here about that. Yeah. Gary Burr just released his debut fiction novel. On July 5th, originally he told us on the Talk More Talk podcast it was going to be called Come Together, but it was switched to Reunion, a rock and roll fairy tale. On his Facebook page, Gary calls it the perfect book for Beatle fans of all ages, a what-if rock and roll fairy tale that will have you tapping your feet and licking your finger to turn the page. Gary actually wrote those words. Actually, I just did an interview with Gary Burr. And he told me that this uh, book is about, imagine that John was never murdered, that it's 1998 and Linda has just passed away. And the four Beatles agreed to give one concert performance. What would it be like? That's what this book is all about. It's supposed to be comedic. I haven't read it yet. I'm going to read it. but um, And I'm going to be giving away copies of that on my website, which we'll talk about later. Uh, Julian Lennon says he's working on a few tracks for release later this year with his longtime collaborator, Justin Clayton. He describes them as really fun indie rock style tracks and then some. And he added then back to the Venice exhibition work next week. John Bazzini, of course, we thank just about all the shows we do here for this news. And finally, the sad news that Kinky Friedman has yeah. died at the age of 79. The eccentric musician from Texas was also a journalist, novelist, and once ran for governor in Texas. He was known for songs like Sold American and Ringo Starr recorded a song with Kinky called Men's Room in LA from his album Lasso from El Paso in which Ringo actually played the voice of Jesus on that recording. He considered Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan among his closest friends. Okay. We I will didn't miss know you, about Kinky. The Ringo track, so that's something. Okay. Well, it's it's one of those side projects. Uh, yeah. You could actually listen to on YouTube, Men's Room in LA, Kinky Freeman with Ringo. Okay. You have to decide for yourself whether Ringo is convincing as Jesus in this song. <laughs> and. That's it for the news. Okay. And we're going to be talking to Evans Mirages now. But first, Dave, um, Cincinnati Opera has provided us a short rehearsal clip. So it's, you know, it's not not yet from the staging rehearsal. So they're just sort of, you know, singing in a rehearsal room. But um, give give you a couple of seconds of sense of what the performance is like. <laughs>
So we're here this time with Evans Mirages, who is the artistic director of the Cincinnati Opera. And the Cincinnati Opera in its summer festival for this year is presenting Paul McCartney's Liverpool Oratorio in a staged production. The other things being presented this year are Don Giovanni and La Traviata. So probably Paul is relatively happy to be in that crowd. Um, the performances of Liverpool Oratorio are July 18th, 20th, 21st, 25th, and 27th. I'll put the website for Cincinnati Opera in the information box, um, but it's pretty easy. It's www.cincinnatiopera.org and you can find the Liverpool Oratorio information there. So, um, Evans, there's, a, you know, as you know, a long history of staging oratorios, even though they're not normally meant to be staged particularly, um, uh, but they often work because they have stories. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what led you to consider doing uh, Liverpool Oratorio? In 2018, we presented the U.S. premiere of an opera by Julian Bilodeau called Another Brick in the Wall, which was based on the Pink Floyd album, The Wall. Oh. Roger Waters gave permission to this French-Canadian creative team to take the words from the album and make a brand new opera. Oh. Uh, he forbade them from using whole swaths of his music. Hmm. They did use a couple of the famous uh, licks, of course. Uh, we don't need no education. It survives intact in the opera. <laughs> and the whole trial scene towards the end of the album is uh, intact in the opera, in part because it was written mostly by Michael Kamen, a very fine American uh, film right. school. We had a great success with Another Brick in the Wall. We had five performances, nearly sold out all of them. Mm -hmm. And so our board chairman at the time said, so what are you going to do to follow up on this? What's the next piece that you are going to bring to the opera that, as it were, passes the old Hubert Humphrey test? You know, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck. And meaning is a work of that has operatic potential that might attract an audience that wouldn't normally consider going to an opera because mm -hmm. there's a familiar name attached to it. And my chief executive, Chris Milligan, uh, was a big fan of Liverpool Oratorio, the recording when it came out uh, in the early 90s, and he suggested it. So I bought the score, I got the recording, and I started working through it. And I realized, much to my delight, that it really is an opera. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's solos and duets. The characterizations are very, very clear. Great chorus scenes. Lots of instrumental music, including a sort of a swan length. Uh, Swan Lake length violin solo, and it's 87 minutes long. And uh, so I reported back to Chris. I said, I think it's a great idea. I think it could be staged. So that's how it started. Then we obviously had to find out if Paul McCartney would let us do it. So you had to ask MPL for permission to stage it? I got a hold of Nancy Jeffries, who is the U.S. representative for MPL. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote to her and she said, well, you know, you're not the first person to pose this question. A couple of times in the past, uh, others have approached us to stage it and it's never come to anything. So um, let me ask Paul. We got an answer back pretty quickly. He's very interested. Do you have some sense of how you would do it? So um, that led us to a rather unusual way of approaching a production. Normally, when we t decide to do a new production of, let's say, of an existing work, first thing I look for is a director, uh, obviously, because that's going to be the concept uh, of the dramaturgy. And in this case, I found a designer first, because we had worked with a very celebrated English designer by the name of Leslie Travers mm -hmm. uh, for a wonderful marriage of Figaro that we rented from Minnesota Opera in 2019. And our lighting designer, Thomas Hasse, remembered that Leslie Travers has a personal connection to Paul McCartney. Uh, Leslie has taught at LIPA and had just been at LIPA, Paul's, you know, the institute of, um, that Paul supports in Liverpool, and uh, that he was acquainted with, with Paul. So we contacted Leslie and he said, you know, this is so coincidental because during the worst of the lockdown in COVID, I get stir crazy in London and want to go to my place in Ireland. 
And normally what he'd do is he'd take the train to Liverpool and then take the ferry boat to Ireland. And he found himself on more than one occasion wandering around a virtually empty Liverpool during the worst of the lockdown with his headphones on, listening to, of all things, Liverpool Oratorio. <laughs> and he said, it's like fate has brought us together. So I said, we need a preliminary concept. We don't need fleshed out drawings. We don't need, but how would you do this? So Leslie came back with some interesting drawings that basically started with the concept that the piece is for a concert hall. And that what happens as the piece begins to develop is that bits and pieces of the concert hall disintegrate and the settings of the oratorio evolve out of what is essentially a stage. Hmm. So we sent that to Paul McCartney and we got the high sign back that, you know, obviously you're working with a great designer, full speed ahead. You have my blessing. Um, not only that, he sent us a lovely letter, uh, which basically helped us with fundraising. So now you have to find the rest of the creative team. And after a couple of false starts, we settled on a director, not settled, but we found a director by the name of Caroline Clegg, mm -hmm. very experienced English director who has done both straight theater and a lot of opera. And she happens to be from Manchester, just down the road from Liverpool. She calls herself a proud Lancashire lass. <laughs> and uh, we, we paired them up and then we had the enterprising idea, instead of trying to do this triangulation of concept development and whatnot across, you know, two continents, why don't we all go to Liverpool and meet there? So our choreographer, Michael Papalardo, whom I had selected, Caroline, Leslie, our lighting designer, Thomas, and myself went to Liverpool towards the end of August last year. Now that should ring bells with you guys. It didn't with me until I got there. We, of course, were there on Beatles week and we didn't, we didn't, we didn't plan it. The city was overrun with thousands and thousands of baby boomers going to concerts and filling the pubs and doing open mic nights. At the, it's like, it was like, oh, my gosh, could we have picked a better time? The weather was nice, too. So we spent three days in Liverpool, walk, tromping around the city, going, of course, to the cathedral, where I happened to find by pure happenstance, one of the guides uh, who was dressed in a red cassock to help tourists find their way around the cathedral said, well, what are you doing here? Because we obviously looked like we were lost and very curious. Hmm. And I told him what we were doing. He says, well, I sang at the premiere. What would you like to know about it? He was a chorister. Oh, so I, I, sat, I sat him down immediately and did a, an interview with him, which I just I posted on my Facebook page a couple of days ago. Uh, and so we were laboring under a lucky star in Liverpool. And Caroline and Leslie got together. And on our last morning, they did a presentation for us after these two days. They spent a lot of time on their own. We spent some time together. And uh, they unveiled what has become our production. Because they both agreed that after studying the piece, Liverpool itself is at the heart of the story. It's a love letter to Paul's hometown. Mm -hmm. And although it is an original story, as you guys know, it is based on a lot of his recollections from his childhood, um, the, the essence of what it is to be a Liverpudlian and all of that sort of thing. So they presented us their concept drawings, which was basically an enormous map of the city of Liverpool from 1942, which begins, which forms the entire stage floor. It begins in the upper left-hand corner of your view and sort of falls down onto the stage and then even drapes over to the right-hand side of your view on almost into the orchestra pit. And of course, the center of it is the River Mercy. Uh, and so Liverpool is the set, a map of Liverpool from 1942. Mm. The various scenes come on and off very adroitly. Uh, the schoolroom then turns into the graveyard because they upend the desks and put flowers in them. Obviously, the, the two working spaces are those desks then turned into uh, desks for working people. It's incredibly cleverly done. And because the piece is somewhat cinematic, uh, it's done in a way that scene changes can happen very quickly. So they came up with this delightful concept that shows Liverpool at the heart and the center of the piece. So then it came time to cast it. And as you all know, um, the four soloists who did the world premiere are the voices on which Carl and Paul McCartney wrote the right. piece. They had the voices of Kiri Teikanawa, Sally Burgess, Jerry Hadley, and Willard White in their ears. Mm -hmm. So all four solo parts are so congenially crafted. I mean, 
Kiri is basically the countess from the marriage of Figaro and Sally Burgess is every, you know, pants mezzo soprano you can think of. And Jerry Hadley is the quintessential American tenor, God rest his soul. And Sir Willard White is, you know, the bass baritone of all bass baritones. So I wanted to find voices that were similar, not copycats, but voices that had some of the same qualities. And we've gotten very lucky. Uh, Jacqueline Eccles McCarley, who is our Mary D. Uh, I first saw her singing The Countess in The Marriage of Figaro as a student. Um, our mezzo-soprano Kaylee Decker is an Octavian. Uh, she's to the manor born. And Andrew Owens, who is our tenor, uh, an American who's living mostly in Europe, has an eerie resemblance in his tonal qualities to Jerry. He's the quintessential healthy American tenor. And Kevin Short is our bass baritone. And he, too, is channeling his inner Willard White. He also happens to be African-American. So um, it wonderful serendipity in finding these people. So we're we're excited. We're in the middle. We're as you know, we're towards the end of the rehearsal process. Uh -huh. OK. Um, did you have to uh, or were you allowed to make any sort of changes in the text, you know, add extra dialogue, anything like that? Or did it just fall into place exactly as it is? One of the few things that Paul's people said to us is, please don't change a note and don't change a word. Hmm. Um, and uh, I found that a very easy, easy um, request because um, the work is very strong. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we did with his permission was that as I said, the work is somewhat cinematic, and there are a couple of places in the piece where we just didn't have enough time to get from one scene to the next, and if we were to follow the music dramaturgically. So I sent Paul a very detailed battle plan whereby we would take the last, let's say, 30 seconds of the piece, of the section that we needed to make longer, and simply repeat it and it was vocal music, we would have it reorchestrated into instruments, mm -hmm. uh, or we would do a repeat of something. And he readily gave his permission. So we've we've done what they used to call in Broadway, a little traveling music, but it's all the music from the oratorio itself and just a repeat. We just cut out the voices as it were and replaced it with, uh, uh, with instruments. But that's the only change. The, the okay. piece is intact from beginning to end. Okay, I'm going to pass you along to Ken, and we'll go around and uh, each take turns asking you questions. Sure, go ahead. Ken? Okay, first of all, um, did Paul himself want to make any suggestions with the way this was staged? Did he no. want to get involved in any way? He He basically gave his blessing to it and said, Sally forth. So we've done just that. Okay. Did you approach um, Carl Davis in any way? Oh, that's a very, very happy memory. So as I was going through the score and making this initial realization that they had to have had an idea of something more than just a stand and sing at some point. Um, so I contacted Carl. Uh, I had never met him. He, you know, he's born in Brooklyn, but he's lived most of his professional creative life in the UK. Um, and I had great admiration for the work that he'd done with the Charlie Chaplin films and had followed him as a conductor of Pops concerts. And uh, at the age of 85, he was still completely spry and with it and busy. And he did demure from conducting it himself. He said, I want a younger generation conductor to take this piece on. But he said, I'd be happy to meet you. So we made a date. I flew to England in May of 2023. Um, and we spent a wonderful afternoon. At the time, he was living not too far from Henley, outside of London, where they have the regatta. He's living in a town called Marlow. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I got there around, oh, just before lunchtime. Uh, and we worked for about four, five solid hours in his office in Marlow, going through the score page by page. And I asked him, you know, why did you do this here? And what does that mean there? And, oh, this motive, you decided to bring that back over here. And we had an incredibly productive and very, very helpful walk through the score. And I asked him, I said, did you guys think that this would be turned into an opera at some point? He said, well, we never really talked about it. But uh, the the big violin solo, I mean, it's, it's ballet music. You mm -hmm. know, the, the, the long prelude of uh, before, you know, the beginning of war, 
I mean, that's a very atmospheric piece with just, you know, vocalized ahs from the chorus, clearly indicating a visualization in some way of what that moment must have been like during the Blitz of Liverpool in, 19, in the 1940s. So he said effectively, yeah, we, I think we'd hoped that someone would actually turn this into a stage work, but we never really talked about it. So um, there was one transition and a modulation that I questioned. I said, what's that there for? <laughs> he was very sweet. He said, well, we needed to get to this key and we were in this key. And I thought, well, rather than write something new, I'll just do this sort of elaborate modulation that goes somewhere. <laughs> it's, about, it's about eight bars. And I, and, uh, and I said, well, can we cut it if we need to? And he said, we're going to have to ask Paul. So we got into the initial conversation about staging. And I asked Caroline, I said, there's this one little funny part. She said, oh, no, 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 no. No, I have the perfect thing for that moment. It's This is going to allow us to do it. So in the end, I didn't even change that. Okay. So, um, but Carl was so, so helpful. And we spent the rest of the evening having a delicious Italian meal. Uh, and and I left. Uh, we made plans right away for Carl to be with us for the last at least week or so of the rehearsal process now. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, he, uh, you know, he was all enthusiastic. He said, I'll do whatever press you want me to do, because he said, I know Paul's a little shy about doing press and so on and so forth, um, but I'll, I'll help you in whatever way I can. Um, and ironically, uh, in August, in early August, uh, one day I got a phone message from Carl. I was in a rehearsal or something, and I couldn't catch the phone. And he said to me, by the time I got to it, it was like six o'clock in the evening. And he said, Evans, I have this most wonderful idea about your production. Can you give me a call? So I was planning on calling him the very next morning, which I did, and I got his voicemail, only to learn not more than 10 hours later that that morning he died of a stroke. Oh. So I was never able to hear his uh, his great inspiration. And if I have any sadness about what we're about to embark on is that I think Carl would have loved it. I think he would have loved being here. I think he would have loved helping us in whatever way he could realize this new dimension of this lovely piece that he had a, a very important hand in bringing to the world. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul hasn't seen any advanced video that you could send him of what you've been working on, right? I'm about to send him something, actually. Yeah. Okay. Just a little snippet from rehearsal in the room. Um, okay. What he has probably seen, because he's not living under a rock, is that we did start a campaign a couple of months ago called Come Together Since He Bring Paul to Music Hall. <laughs> And I have recorded videos with 4,000 people at an open air concert and the entire cast and chorus and orchestra. He's probably seen those and it's probably raised a smile, but we haven't sent him any video yet. I'll probably send something in the next couple of days just so he can see a little bit. Did Carl get to see anything? No, of course, because he passed away last August and it's long right. before, it's even before we had our epical meeting in Liverpool to really flesh out the uh, idea. He saw, I, I carried with me uh, images of the original concept that Leslie Travers had come up with and he was highly enthusiastic about that, but he didn't live to see the, the design that we are actually using. Yeah, I understand yeah. you have a photo of you and Carl that you can share with us. I will, I will, I'll send it along to you and you can use it. It's really okay. sweet. Okay, so um, the score itself was not changed in any way. It's the exact nope. same score as as it was before. So we got the we got the full score. They printed new full scores for us from Faber, uh, which is the publisher of the work. Uh, there were there were three text anomalies in the full score uh, that were clearly things that were done in the heat of orchestration. That Carl must have just missed a word or two. The piano, I decided that the piano vocal score, which is the published score, was the or text for notes and words, because it's been in circulation ever since. It's been used by everyone who's produced the piece. So we made we made three word changes in the orchestra score because the singers all got the piano vocal score. So they learned everything correctly. Hmm. And there was one mistake in the in the score in that they had just in the reprinting, they had transposed three pages. Mm -hmm. So we just cut them out and we glued them in the right right order. But that's it. It's uh, it's as including um, we don't have a pipe organ in musical, uh, and because it was written for Liverpool Cathedral with an you know an incredible uh, pipe organ in the cathedral, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to accomplish that. Music Hall does have a really excellent electronic organ. 
I think it's a Rogers or an Allen, I can't remember, which they use for, you know, the Saint-Saëns Organ Symphony and all the big, big stuff that they do. So we're using that. Um, and it, uh, as I said, I came from the, from the first orchestra with singers rehearsal today. Sounds magnificent. Really, really when, when, when they, when they apply the organ, it gives a, a fundament to the bass sound and it's really exciting. Okay. One last thing I want to ask you have involved with this entire production. You have the Cincinnati opera chorus, the Cincinnati boy choir, the Cincinnati symphony orchestra and the Cincinnati ballet. Now, you were alluding to the ballet before. Is that for the violin piece that you were talking about? Or how do you work ballet into this? What I thought was that the piece cries out for choreography. And one of the first ideas I had about this, which I'm very happy to say that our choreographer, Michael Papalardo, has adopted, is that in order to give another dimension to both Shanty and Mary D. I wanted them to have basically body doubles as dancers. You've seen this done before, mm -hmm. where um, the tenor has sort of an alter ego dancer um, and the soprano has an alter ego, alter ego dancer. Um, and with the female, in other words, the alter ego for Mary D, Caroline and Caroline Clegg and Michael Papalardo actually recast her. They actually gave her a name. They're calling her Hope. Um, because she not only dances as sort of Mary D's shadow and body double, but she also has solo moments of her own. And so, uh, and there are four other dancers. And what we use the six dancers total, the two, the two dancers, the, the Shanty double and the Mary D double, follow them around a bit. They don't tag along like, you know, some little brother you're trying to get rid of, but they do have a, a, a presence and there's a wonderful pantomime during father, during the funeral, when the male double, uh, as it were, is dressing himself uh, for the funeral and then eventually sort of breaks that wall and helps Shanty dress for the funeral by putting on a tie. Um, and there's a wonderful poignant moment in Crises where Mary D is in the hospital on the bed. And during that climactic moment when she decides she's going to live and she's not going to let the spirits take her and her child, she adroitly changes places with the dancer so that she can go into the crowd and then come out with her big moment. So Michael has used the dancers both to, um, they're, they're, they dance in the crypt dance, they have their own big solo pas de deux, pas de quatre actually for four of them. And so we have simply taken the cue from the dramaturgy and Michael and Caroline have devised moments that are really for the dancers moments in which the dancers reinforce the larger action and moments which, in which the dancers really flesh out our understanding of who Mary D and Shanti are. Hmm. Well, very interesting. A lot of work put into that. Tremendous. A lot of imagination put into that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the nice things about working with someone like Caroline, who's both a theatrical director and an opera director, yeah. she speaks opera, which means she understands that there are constraints on our time, uh, there are constraints on union regulations as to how many hours people can work and so on and so forth. It's not like straight theater where you can you know, rehearse for eight hours a day. Hmm. And she combines that knowledge and that sort of specificity of character development that rarely happens in opera, but always happens in theater with her operatic understanding that, all right, well, we do have only six hours in this day. And so this is how we're going to make this work. So a lot of the work is done by the director and the choreographer outside the studio. They do enormous amount of preparation so that they can most efficiently use the time of the artist when they're in the studio choreographing and blocking. All right. Very good. Thank you. Darren? Um, I want to go back to the beginning, Evans, and ask you a question from a complete novice uh, when it comes to opera. Um, and classical music as a whole. Can you, first off, tell us what is the difference between an opera and an oratorio? Because there are similarities, I know that, but they're, if they were the same, <laughs> they, would, they wouldn't have separate names describing them. So can you go back to the beginning and explain the difference and what needs to be done to kind of blur the lines between the two even more? Basically, if you want the definition of oratorio for someone who may not have a lot of familiarity with classical music, 
say Messiah. So Handel's Messiah is done every year in every church, in every concert hall in the world. And what is it? It's actually unusual for an oratorio. It's a little bit of an outlier, but is the most famous one. Oratorios developed in general, and Handel was one of the primary movers and shakers of this, because during the Lenten season, um, particularly in the Anglican religion and the Catholic religion, theaters were closed. You couldn't do opera. It was sinful to do during Lent. But Handel and his, particularly in his years in London, had this troupe of singers that he had employed for a season. And there was all of this 40 to 50 days in which they couldn't perform. But the uh, church authorities did not forbid a sacred work that told a story as long as you didn't have costumes and makeup and, God forbid, dancing. So Handel developed this, not single-handedly, but he was the one who really brought it into commercial popularity. He was the, the astute businessman of all classical music composers. And so he said, okay, well, if I can't present operas, why don't I take great stories, primarily biblical stories, of course, and tell the story with the chorus standing still and with the soloist sometimes taking characterizations, but telling the story, but not moving about the stage, okay. not having costumes and makeup. And if you, it, and it's one of the reasons that so many of Handel's oratorios have now in the Handel revival in the last 65 years have been staged because they're really operas without, without the staging. Right. But, and Messiah being the most famous one is also the anomaly because most oratorios tell a story that can be easily turned into a drama. I'm not going to get too nerdy and classical on you, but if you think of the Bach St. Matthew Passion and the Bach St. John Passion, towering masterpieces of the Baroque, both are basically operas monkey. They tell stories. Some of them incredibly, the John Passion is, is an opera that Bach never wrote because the dramaturgy is there. It's just the action has been taken away. So Messiah is the, is the outlier because they're not real characters. Everything in Messiah is a reflection or a, an, um, or a, a, a thought about something that happened to Jesus. They are observers of the life of Jesus. Jesus is not in Messiah himself. There's no one who sings Jesus in Messiah. There's Jesus in the Matthew and the, and the John Passions, but there's no Jesus in Messiah. So basically, the difference between an oratorio and an opera is it, it says it's necessity is the mother of invention. If you can't stage, you create something that doesn't require staging. Now, long after the time of Handel, when there were no such proscriptions on the idea of performing during Lent, the, um, the oratorio stuck around well into the 19th and 20th centuries. You think of Elijah by Mendelssohn um, moving closer to our own time, the famous oratorios of Elgar, certainly the dream of Garantius and so on and so forth. So the basic difference is that you're not moving about the stage, you're not wearing wigs and makeup. And um, most oratorios, there are secular oratorios, but most of them are on sacred subjects. So that's the, the basic layman's definition. You know, from so a certain point of view, um, this is an oratorio really probably because of who commissioned it. You know, it was commissioned by the Liverpool Philharmonic. If it had been commissioned by an opera company, it might not be that different to work, but it would be an opera. Absolutely. I mean, and probably also because, of course, Liverpool, as you know, Alan, the orchestra commissioned it. There was there was no and there still is no local opera company in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. The north of England is really in, you know, in tough shape in terms of resident opera companies. There's Opera North, which is based in Leeds. There's Scottish Opera. But and now with all that's happening in the UK with the arts, who knows what's going to happen? Right. So but Liverpool has a famous cathedral. The Liverpool Philharmonic had a very fine chorus. The cathedral had its own really fine chorus. And of course, every English cathedral has a boys choir. So it was it was sort of, again, necessity born of the invention was born of the necessity of where they were going to do it. Mm -hmm. Back to Darren. Um, OK, so. You've taken the oratorio and you've essentially enriched the piece because now you've had to do a lot of character development. Mm -hmm. um, how do did you avoid the request from McCartney's camp to not change anything when you really had to develop 
more an ad personality and and um, um, add uh, some characteristics to the characters to say that this is now an opera or at least to make it into an opera how did you dodge that that you don't change anything uh directive that's the genius of paul and carl it's all there the characterizations are finely crafted in the words that he has given these singers mary d is a real person shanty is a real person miss inkley uh, the headmaster, the, 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 his, uh, Mr. Dingle, all of them are real characters. Everything's there. We, don't have, we, didn't have to, we didn't have to labor mightily to actually flesh out the characterizations. What Caroline did as a director is said she looked at the words, she looked at the interactions, because there's a lot of interaction between characters. And it's not, you know, I stand and sing my aria, I stand and sing my aria. There's a lot of dialogues and duets and trios and whatnot. It's all there. What mm. Caroline has done is, as it were, given the individual performers movement and setting up scenes in such a way so that the dramaturgy that is there in the words to begin with is fleshed out with something visual on stage. I'll give you one example. So. Um, in work. So work is divided into basically three parts. There is Mary D, who is in charge. She's running a company. We don't know what company it is, but she's in charge of an office full of women and she's firing off orders that, you know, did you send the fax? Did you arrange the dinner party? Did you cancel my squash date and whatnot? And she's got a whole bunch of people all working around her. Um, the dramaturgy is all there. Mary D is on a desk that's above everybody else with a phone and all the other women are around her on lower desks. Then you have this middle section where uh, it transfers over to Shanty. And Shanty's working in sort of a warehouse with a bunch of his mates. And so what do they have on the other side of the stage? And it's really set up. You can see it in the score that the Shanty and his guys are in their warehouse or whatever it is they're doing. Um, and then he gets tempted to go, you know, for a drink with one of his mates. It's all there. You don't have to change anything. You just have to create blocking. You have to create a scenario, meaning, so what does Shanty's workplace look like? And what does Mary D's workplace look like? It wasn't difficult. There were no, there, we never felt at any point in the rehearsal process, hmm, how do we make drama out of this? It's all there already. Um. Generally speaking, for everyone involved in this, um, I would think that at the beginning of the process of creating this uh, and turning this into an opera, that there were oftentimes you had to refer to the original work. Um, I'm taking that assumption that that was the case, especially early on, going back to the original recording. Um, but was there a point where um, you felt it would be good to distance yourself from the original so as not to do too much blatant copying or, hmm. or, or to keep coming up with fresher ideas for maybe the way the characters will handle a lyric um, or maybe straight throughout. Was there a tendency to lean on the original or, or maybe not? How, how, did, how did that work when it came to question. creating it your own work needing a reference point, but not wanting to rely too heavily on a, a note for note copy. I'd have to ask these four individual soloists how much time they spent actually listening to the recording. Because what happens in rehearsal is that the needs of blocking and the needs of pacing as a theatrical work will encourage you not to change a phrase or to change an emphasis, but might encourage you to take a slightly different tempo for something because you need to cross from this point to that point. So the, the, the score is the Bible. In other words, the notes that Paul and Carl wrote are where everyone starts. Um, I would say probably for the dancer rehearsals before we got to the rehearsal process here, um, they prop, I know they use the commercial recording just to help them set tempos and whatnot. But then it's adapted with our conductor here who said, well, I can take this a little bit faster. You want me to take this a little bit slower? Because the, the physicality of dancing 
uh, requires a tempo that may be two ticks faster than what's on the recording or even three ticks slower than what's in the score. So we have adjusted for live performers. Um, we've gotten a good sort of litmus, as it were, from the recording because those are tempos that um, that Carl approved of, that Paul McCartney approved of. But in the theater, sometimes things have to be slower or faster because uh, just the way that the space interacts with the singers. And also a theater, if you think about the Liverpool Cathedral, some of the tempos are a little bit slower simply because of the acoustic in the cathedral, because you can't play music that goes lickety split or have singers sing things so fast because the acoustic is like an echo chamber. So some of the things that were, and one of the things I, I said to Carl um, when we were talking, I said, you know, in this, I forget which spot it was. I said, this sounds a little slow from your tempo marking in the score. I said, well, if I went any faster, nobody would have understood a word yeah. in Liverpool Cathedral. He said, if you'd come to Carnegie Hall, you would have heard it faster. So we have used the recording as a reference point, uh, but it, that's all it is. It's a reference point. The, it, the interpretation you're going to hear and see in Music Hall is the creation of the performers who are creating it, our conductor, Joseph Young, and our soloists in our chorus. So it's there as a, as a useful tool, but uh, we're not slavishly recreating anything. Mm -hmm. the, the general feeling that you're getting from ticket buyers and uh, people that you speak to uh, now as the days draw, draw closer to the first performance, how, how, um, how well known would you say Liverpool Oratorio is? It's I don't want to do the math here. Uh, 1991 was when McCartney's when it was first released. Uh, is it a new piece for many folks? Um, oh yes, absolutely. Or is it? I think oh, that, yeah, sure. I, when when it was brought up, was it like, oh, you know, we know that? No, I mean, I'm a pretty well informed music lover. If I didn't know about it, mm -hmm. and it's clearly I'm I'm sort of in the majority. Um, okay. And so I think a lot of people are attracted to it because of Paul McCartney's name. I mean, it's doing exactly, it's doing exactly what we'd hoped it would do in that because of the association with a very famous person, people are willing to give it a try. If it's Paul McCartney, it's got to be good mm -hmm. in some way. Right. Um, and what we're hoping will happen when people come into the theater is that they will be simply blown away because... For me, one of the greatest things about this piece, and I wrote about it today on my Facebook page, is that, and Paul has said this himself in the documentary, and he said it in interviews, he said every word, and Carl was at great pains to tell me this when we were together, every note of melody and every word is Paul's. So much of everything else is Carl's deep and long knowledge of orchestration, of vocal writing, I had our, I was on stage before the rehearsal today, and one of the choristers said to me, this writing for the chorus is as good as Verdi, if not even better. He said, every, every line is so suited to, for me, is so suited to my voice type. And the mezzo-soprano standing next to him, she said, yeah, I mean, I never have to sing anything that's too far out of my range or on vowels that are funny for me. Carl, even though he may never have written an opera himself, was brilliant at figuring out what he made those vocal parts fit each of those four original singers like a glove. And they all sound at their best. Kiri Tekanawa sounds like she's singing the Countess in The Marriage of Figaro. Jerry Hadley sounds like he's singing Candide. I mean, Carl was so expert at saying to, and there's a wonderful moment in the documentary actually where the singers do it. So there's one high C in the piece for the tenor. You know, high C is the, is the holy grail for tenors. It's also frightening because it's an unnatural <laughs> sound. And uh, Carl and Paul save it for the, almost the very end of the piece. Poor, the poor tenor, Andrew, is singing all the night. And it sits very, the tenor part does sit a little bit high. And finally, when they get to live in peace, live in peace, that's the one high C. So you will see on the documentary uh, that Jerry and Paul and Carl are in a rehearsal and Paul and, and Carl have placed the, the C a little early or a little bit later. I think they said, live in peace. And Jerry says, 
Singing a high C on the E vowel is not very good. What if we shift that high C one beat earlier to N, which can be a, a more congenial vowel to sing a high note? So what has happened in this collaboration is that you have the inspiration and the melodic gift and the beautiful storytelling of Paul McCartney and an absolute master of every aspect of orchestration and vocal writing and pacing fitting the, the fitting the piece and giving it its as it were its fancy dress hmm. all right i just go back to alan we go back around okay for... when the work had its premiere i went to liverpool to cover it for the times and mm -hmm. um MPL was really secretive about it. You could not get a score to look at in advance, which, you know, critics sometimes like to do so that we have some sense of what we're going to hear. Um, so I called Jerry Hadley because I had interviewed him before and, you know, he was, as you know, a good guy. And, uh, and we had a long talk about it and um, he was, you know, I, Singers and, and musicians often absolutely love whatever it is they're working on because they're spending so much time on it. And 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 you have to, if you don't love it, it, it it's hard to give a real performance. But I got I, I got a sense that he really meant, I mean, he he was so enthusiastic about mm -hmm. what this work could be for theater and opera mm -hmm. theater as well. And uh, you know. It, and so I'm I'm really glad to see it being done not and not just sort of like ending in 1991 after the first sure. rounds of performances were over, but Jerry also did tell me one really interesting story that that um, I want to pass on. Please, um, you know, Jerry as a kid was in a rock band. I can't remember what the name of it was, but we had talked about it before when I interviewed him earlier and he just mentioned it again and he said you know when i went to paul's place in sussex to you know sit at the piano with him and go through some of the stuff um he showed me that you know he had this bass that was owned by bill black linda bought it for him in 1974 for his birthday bill black was elvis's bassist oh and, my god and paul said to him well you know let's just why don't we just do an elvis tune you know let's do heartbreak hotel and he handed Jerry an acoustic guitar and Jerry played it and sang Heartbreak Hotel. Paul played on the stand up bass and Jerry said, man, I can't believe I just sang Heartbreak Hotel with Paul McCartney playing Bill Black's bass. And Paul said, oh, that's nothing. You just played it on Elvis's guitar. <laughs> oh, my God. That's great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So I'm I'm wondering, you know, in terms of, you know, Jerry having this secret rock and roll past behind his operatic career, if you have any sense of who the audience for this is, you wanted you said you wanted to reach people who didn't necessarily go to opera, but I think most opera people our age probably also were Beatle fans as kids. Sure. And I was. I bought the 45s every week they came out. <laughs> At the checkout counter of my local supermarket, because in those days, in the 60s, they would have a rack of 45 RPM records, the top 25, which you could buy for 98 cents a piece. So I used my allowance and bought Beatles records. That sounds about right. <laughs> um, but do you have any like demographic info about who the ticket buyers are and who's coming to this? Not quite yet. I think that one of the things that is encouraging is that um, normally, so that you understand where we are, we live in the region where the population base for Cincinnati itself within the city limits is under 300,000 people. The metro region is just over a million and a half. We don't have a huge population base. We don't have the population base of Chicago or New York or Philadelphia or LA or any of the other big cities with big opera numbers. So for us to do um, more than two performances of a work in a season, it has to be one of the top 10 operas. For us to do more than three performances of a work, it has to be either Aida or Carmen. That's basically it. Because of, just because of the population base, we are not a huge tourist destination. We have a pretty good baseball team. We have one of the great aquariums in the country, and uh, but it's we don't have those kinds of attractions. So 
that's a long-winded way of saying that most of our audience is local. We're doing five performances of the right. four. We don't do five performances of Aida. Uh, and the ticket demand has been such that I'm sure people are coming from greater distances to see this piece, as they did with another brick of the wall. I would imagine the audience will be evenly divided between people like us who, you know, who remember the Beatles and who have an affinity for opera. Uh, what is pleasantly surprising is I talked to some of my younger choristers. There's a whole new wave of people who loved the sound of the Beatles and the sound of McCartney's songs in a, in a not a necessarily nostalgic way, in a retro way. It's a little bit like the return of vinyl. But I will tell you one thing about your story. Our tenor, Andrew Owens, who is a member of the ensemble of the Zurich State Opera, he has two secret passions, both of which he's put on his Facebook page. He does a drop-dead imitation of Mario Lanza. And two nights ago, he just he just posted himself playing a Bruce Springsteen classic. <laughs> so what is it about our wonderful American tenors who always want to be rock and rollers or pop singers? So there, <laughs> there, is, there is that affinity. I just think that one of the things that makes me so excited about this piece, I don't think no one needs to make an apology for anything that is created by an artist. I think one of the things I hope it will do is something that I realized sitting in the theater today. As I, like you guys, I've heard the recording. I'm sure I can imagine in my mind's ear what it sounds like in a concert setting. One of the things I noticed today is with the orchestra in the pit and a beautiful production on stage and our 48 voice professional chorus, the actual sound of the piece, it's an opera. It, it, the, the piece has a kind of dramatic urgency coming off the stage that it doesn't have in a recording or it doesn't have in a concert setting. Mm -hmm. There is something about the sonics of being in an opera house with a good pit and a good acoustic that gives this piece an extra urgency and a power. I mean, I nearly lost it to hear the, the full chorus, you know, and Fortissimo singing Father when the when Shanti is told that his father has died or the final live in peace, you know, with the big high C. There's something very special about this piece becoming an opera. I think it's 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 got a it's I hope it will have a new life because this production is gorgeous. And it's only it's under 90 minutes. So for mm. the attention deficit disorder <laughs> younger crowd, I think it's going to be great. No intermission. Okay. What do you see beyond this production? Well, first of all, is is there any chance that this will be recorded and released in any way, like a DVD? Because that would be different from the oratorio itself. And is there any hope of maybe one of these performances being streamed? Right now, we don't have plans for either of those, in part because of the expense involved even though we have an incredible relationship with the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and really good relations with our singers union, the price tag for that is astronomical because it's also a work in copyright. Um, and so uh, as we will, we always make with the permission of the publisher, we make what's called a scratch video. And that is a single camera that captures the production mostly for other companies who will mount this production so they can have a visual reference point. All of our performances are recorded for National Public Radio. So we will be granted a one-time tape-delayed broadcast permission to broadcast the performance that we're creating. Um, and so it, that will have some circulation. Um, I wish we could. Uh, it's just that we've had to raise well over three quarters of a million dollars to just create the piece and create the production and 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 produce it. So um, the costs of actually capturing it for recording, even with the much more liberal, uh, what's called the integrated media agreements today that are uh, that are abroad in the land in the United States, it's just it's just too much money, sadly. You just mm. have to come to Cincinnati and see it. There are five performances. Get on a plane. <laughs> Do you have Is an arrangement to, to lend it to other companies or other companies to take it up after you've done it? I am not at liberty to say which company it is, but we are about to have a signed contract for uh, the second production of our production next summer. Uh, and other opera companies are coming to Cincinnati to view the production. My guess is, I mean, my hope is 
that this will encourage a lot of opera companies to do it because it's a great production. It is a little bit elaborate. It's beautiful, but it is also, it has the, it has ticket drawing potential that particularly, I think if we have the kind of success I think we're going to have, I think other companies are going to be really interested in taking it because you can put on many more performances of this than you can of John Skiki and sell a lot of tickets. And it sounds like an opera because it was written for opera singers. Could you ever see anything like this on Broadway or in L.A. or, you know, the biggest cities? You know, the, the challenge with something uh, like this is that I'm not, I'm not so sure it's a piece you could sing six nights a week. It is vocally taxing enough. And the mm. other challenge is that it requires a big chorus. The piece would sound totally weenie with 24 voices, even if you amplified them. Um, one of the things that impressed me just a few weeks ago is I went to New York to see uh, the um, City Center Encore's performance of Titanic. Uh, and that was 32 voices, really heavily and brilliantly mic'd. And I was sitting in the theater thinking, you know, I, Liverpool Oratorio is not going to work for anything less than 48 or 50 professional voices. And that's just beyond the economics of Broadway. So not so sure. It, and it's also very taxing. I don't think you could sing it six nights in a row. Hmm. Yeah. Um, how do things look as far as Paul attending the premiere or any of the performances? <laughs> We're tireless in our efforts to sure. entice him. We've posted countless videos. We have a campaign, Get Paul to Music Hall. He has sent us a lo lovely video that we'll play at the opening night that says, you know, he can't be here for the opening night. Um, his folks were very, very specific and say he cannot be there for the opening. So who knows? There are five more, there are four more performances after that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I would be delighted. The only thing I would, you know, absolutely require is that since he is the composer of the work, just like we do with any work of a living composer, he comes on stage at the end of the evening and takes a bow. So, you know, if he if he comes, that's great. Um, it would just be icing on the cake. We're just excited as can possibly be to be able to give this piece um, a new life um, in, mm -hmm. a, in, in a piece that one of the soloists came up to me the other day and said, look, I, I took this engagement because I love Cincinnati Opera and I've always wanted to work here. And this is a chance for me to work with you all. Um, and he says, and I, I took the score home, obviously, when I was invited to sing it, I went through it and I thought, yeah, I can sing this. This is fine. This is not particularly taxing. He said, but what's happened to me during the rehearsal process is I've realized that Paul and Carl had been very subtly in their own way talking about much bigger issues than this little story, that they talk about your place in the world and the importance of having a family. And it's not necessarily the family of the, the nuclear family. It's the family that you make of the people that you care about. And Caroline has been very specific in her direction, particularly towards the end, of there are all sorts of kinds of families. Um, and the final scene is really touching. And he came to me, he's, he finished his remarks to me by saying, you know, this piece is a lot deeper than I gave it credit for at first hearing. And I mm. hope that's what some people, I read, I went back and reread all the, uh, all the, uh, all the critics uh, at the premiere, um, including the very favorable one who's in the room. And what I came away with was these women and men who reviewed the piece at the time, who weren't all that favorable about it, the world has changed a lot since 1991. What defines itself as an opera these days, or what works as a dramatic presentation, is a much broader and more inclusive and multi-genre art form now than it was in 1991. And I think that is uh, owing to the musical pluralism that has overtaken our country, particularly, the enormous numbers of kinds of music that are enthusiastically embraced. And the definition of opera has broadened. I mean, all you have to do is look at some of the most recent operas by people like Terence Blanchard, a celebrated jazz composer, mm -hmm. who has written two really popular operas, Champion and Fire Shut Up in My Bones. And, um, or Malcolm X, the, 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 the revival of Anthony Davis is up. That's a really thorny, sort of almost conservatory style of writing, but it's a powerful piece. I think time, I think one of the reasons I'm almost, I won't say happy, but one of the things I'm interested in is that this work has been a little bit of a sleeping beauty. 
in that it had its vogue at the beginning and then it sort of faded from view. And as time passes and a piece is given a new look and a new hearing, audiences are different now. So I'm excited. I think it's going to get a, diff a much different critical reaction. Hmm. Well, I certainly hope that this and, and all of Paul's classical works get to be more appreciated as time goes by. Uh, Darren, you have any uh, last questions? Yeah, uh, and it actually comes out of what we were just talking about. Now that the Liverpool Oratorio is done, <clears throat> has there been any talk or are there any thoughts about not only exploring some of McCartney's other classical pieces, but other pop artists who have dip their toe <clears throat> into uh, into classical. Billy Joel comes to mind. Uh, Joe Jackson comes to mind. And Joe Jackson wrote a full-blown opera. Might have won, might have also won a Grammy Award for one of the things he did. Um, could this now open the door to, for uh, further ex ex exploration into McCartney stuff, the other McCartney works, or another artist? So most of the rest of the McCartney output is instrumental, so it's not my purview. Um, but I think the, and this is not a pat answer, but I think if this is a success, this revival and this new imagination on Paul McCartney's Liverpool Oratorio, it does open the door to either other new works that have been created. I know that our friends up in Canada who created another brick in the wall were looking at, um, well, what's the next concept album that could make a great opera. Because if you remember, you know, the, the, the concept albums are things like Jesus Christ Superstar and The Wall and several others of that genre that all had this great flowering in the late 70s and early, uh, mid 70s and late 70s. Um, there are other very theatrical, popular music expressions that given the right team could be turned into things that we call opera. But I do think, I do think that and for me, one of the great sorrows of the pandemic is I think another brick in the wall is terrific. It just got stymied by the fact that we did our production. Uh, there was the premiere in Canada. We did our production and all the plans for subsequent productions fell by the wayside during COVID. And the producers just haven't been able to recover the momentum. I mm. have a feeling that if this is a success, is as much of a success as I think it is, I think it will show opera companies that the definition has brought one of the it's it's not a challenge, but one of the things that make makes Liverpool Oratorio uniquely suited, and it, it gets us into this whole territory of should opera companies produce musicals. If you're talking about an opera company, the one thing I want to emphasize too is we're not amplifying this. The boy soloist is amplified because he has a very small voice in a very large theater. But our soloists and our chorus and our orchestra are not amplified. It's just like in a concert hall. And this work was written with operatic voices, meaning that Carl and Paul heard the voice of Kirite Kanawa and they have her sing in an operatic style. So then the question becomes, um, is something that is going to be fashioned from another rock and roll or pop music composer, is it going to be written in an operatic style? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I'm curious about Titanic, even though it is written in a slightly more, let's say, more modern Broadway vocal style, is that it is has a great symphonic score and really wonderful vocal ambitions. There are some musicals that can't be done by opera companies and shouldn't be done by opera companies. We don't have the expertise. That singing style has changed. It's one of the reasons that I'm curious if to, if to see if we could do a musical going in a slightly different direction. It's got to be something that's earlier. It's got to be something from an era when those lines were written for voices that could pass for opera singers. Mm. So once we get into our more modern time, once we get into things like Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis and Rent and, and the raft of modern uh, modern musicals, opera companies have no business doing those because they're, they're we've got the wrong kind of singers. doesn't mean we shouldn't produce them, but we, if we're going to do them, we have to recognize that we're, we're doing a different kind of genre and we're going to have to import that expertise into our lives. So we could spend hours talking about this. If if Liverpool Oratorio is a success, I think others will follow. Okay. 
Okay, well, thanks so much, Evans, for um, spending some time with us and walking us through this production. Um, it really sounds exciting. Well, all the best to you guys. Thank you for your advocacy because it, it, it really helps us. Get the word out because there's still plenty of time to get on a plane and come here. Right. We definitely Absolutely. will. Absolutely. And Paul, you. if you're watching, I've done this once before with other people and they have come on our show. So That's Paul, right. if you want. Go to Cincinnati. Yeah. Go to Cincinnati. <laughs> Thank you. I will send you that photograph of myself and Carl, too, by the way. I'll do that right after. All right. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, gentlemen. Okay, so that was sort of interesting and a, a little surprising. I hadn't actually known about this uh, this production, um, and the Cincinnati Opera reached out and said, "Hey, you know, um, you should do something about this on things we said today," and it seemed only natural. So mm -hmm. let's go around and give our contact information. Uh, we'll start with Ken. Okay, if you would like to reach me directly. Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. On my own YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, which we all agreed really should be <laughs> called Ken Michaels Video, one of these days I will change it. Um, I started a new, a new feature called The Deeper You Go, in which I invite my guests to pick 10 deep tracks, anything but hits, from either the Beatles as a group or one of them individually. And because of Ringo's birthday just happening, I had three guests come on to my channel to each give me their list of 10 deep tracks from Ringo's solo career. And they were Bruce Sugar, who has been a guest here on this channel, Ringo's co-producer. He's also co-written songs with Ringo. And it's nice to have him back. You should check out the interview that we did with him because it was fantastic. And uh, also someone else we had not that long ago on our channel, Gary Burr, who um, has been a member of Ringo's Roundheads back in the Mark Hudson days, uh, has written a lot of songs with Ringo, has been on a lot of the albums post Mark Hudson. And he's actually going to be on the upcoming country album from Ringo with a mm -hmm. song that he's written. And we also have, <clears throat> and we also have Scott O'Rourke, who is a name that I've mentioned here on the show because he gives me lots of information that I put into the news every show, uh, especially for some reason, he seems to be able to know about new cover versions of Beatles songs and solo <laughs> songs faster than anybody else. So then I relay it back to you guys, but he always has some information that I could use in the news for which I'm very grateful. And he does a Beatles program called with the Beatles, on WUSB, which is the University of Stony Brook on Long Island, every other Thursday. And so he gave me his 10 deep tracks from Ringo's solo career. So if you want to explore those three shows and get a taste of what these three guys think are among the best of Ringo's deeper cuts that most people don't even know, like I said, anything but the hits, go to Ken Michaels Radio. I also did uh, an interview with Luca Parasi, who you know for uh, this particular book, Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas. It's Paul McCartney's solo music from 1970 through 1989. He just put out this new book on Band on the Run, the story of a classic album. So we did a whole show on Band on the Run and information that's offered in his book. Again, that's all at Ken Michaels Radio. Please subscribe to the channel if you can. On my other uh, talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, we are about to do a show on the Mind Games release. It's actually going to be two parts. Um, the first part is more on the history of Mind Games. The second part is all on the box set, which is coming out this week. That should have been part of the news. 
This Friday is the official release date, July 12th. So we're doing two shows back to back on Talk More Talk on Mind Games. It's Mind Games Month on Talk More Talk. Okay. Um, and on my uh, website, kenmichaelsradio.com, as you know, at least I, I hope you know, there is Beatles trivia that's offered um, every couple of weeks here. And there's lots of great prizes you can win. Uh, for the first time, I have a copy of this book. You might question this. All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison Clapton, and other assorted love songs. Now, I have given this away before, but this is the revised edition of the book. And what they have here in the book, since Ken Womack is one of the authors, Ken Womack along with Jason Krupa, um, Ken was doing research on Mal Evans, and he's putting out two books on Mal, one of which has already come out. And looking through uh, Mal's journals and his diaries and all of his paperwork, he uncovered uh, Mal's uh, notations and whatever he wrote down for the All Things Must Pass sessions. So all these years, when you've looked at All Things Must Pass, you've seen a list of all the musicians on the album, but you don't know what they played on? Find out at the end of this book it tells you day by day what the sessions were and who played on what song okay that's in the revised edition now available as a softback of this book okay in addition to that i mentioned gary burr has a brand new book out it's called reunion a rock and roll fairy tale about a fictional beatles reunion that happened in 1998 um, and I'll be giving away copies of that book on my website, and it is signed by Gary Burr himself. So that, along with so many other great prizes, including the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, uh, right there on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Okay, and one more thing, my radio show, Every Little Thing. If you want to catch it, the easiest way to do that is by going to WFDU's website. That's Fairly Dickinson University's website, WFDU.FM. They have a page there for archival shows. They post my last two shows that they ran on their FM signal, and you have two weeks to listen to each show. Okay, so if you've never heard my show before, by all means, every Beatle fan, especially fans that love deep tracks, not just the hits, deeper cuts, music themes, rarities cover versions you name it it's right there in that show every little thing i think i've said every little thing for myself so darren sure. what are you up to um no not not that much what have you been up to oh i'm sorry um me i'm on the radio you know that wfuv and you can listen uh to uh uh to the shows monday through thursday nights Get started at 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning and Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. Um, we, uh, I think I mentioned this on the last show, WFUV Radio, which is in New York City, uh, is um, doing a, uh, is a part of a private um, tour of the Paul McCartney uh, photograph exhibit happening as we speak at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and Thursday night is the night for what is now sold out evening where I will be there. Dennis Elsis will be there. Another one of the DJs, WFUV. And I'm sure those of you in the New York metropolitan area who have been listening to the radio for decades know the name Dennis Elsis. So Dennis and I will be there as part of this private tour. And that's happening Thursday night, perhaps the next show. Um, I'll share some thoughts. Uh, if there's anything really uh, exciting to share about uh about that uh, that tour that we're doing um uh, after hours tour uh this coming thursday at the brooklyn museum anyway so yeah radio shows monday through thursday night start at 10 p.m to 2 a.m and uh saturdays one to four 90.7 fm in the new york city area uh and if you're outside of the new york metropolitan area listen on our website wfuv.org or get our app listen there and i'm on facebook just look me up, Darren DeVivo, shoot me a friend request, or go to my radio page and click like or follow, and we'll be connected there. And uh, I think that's it, Alan. Okay. You want to get in touch with me, um, 
You can find me on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, my email is just alancozen at gmail.com. That will get to me directly. Or you can write to all three of us at Things We Said Today Radio Show, all one word, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. And follow us on Twitter at, at Things We Said Fab. And there's our Facebook page, Things We Said Today video podcast. Right. Like there's like this. this That's nice the logo to look. Handy button. Okay, so it's fun talking to Evans, and we will be back in a couple of weeks with, uh, I believe, a show about uh, mind, mind games. games. We playing them forever. <laughs> <laughs> So for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye.